So I'm here to talk about forests, global forests. Um, does anybody here give me a, a, a response to why and how uh, forests are being cleared? What's the main driver of tropical deforestation right now? Sorry? <laughs> Football? <laughs> Alfonso, you're fine. Food production. Food production, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I thought you said football. <laughs> Good start. No, oh, she's doing it. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm fine with the fish. It's okay. We've heard a lot about fish. Um, I don't have a PPT anyway, so it's fine. But forests, I mean, I work for the Centre for International Forestry Research. We're part of the, the, the broader consultative group of international agricultural research centres. And our mandate is to prove how important forests are, not only for rural livelihoods, but also uh, in recent years for food security. And up to 1.3 billion people are estimated to be reliant and dependent in some way on forests. The level of that dependence varies according to uh, the circumstance, but it's a significant amount of people who rely on forests in, in various ways. People rely on forests for their pharmacopoeia, people, people rely on forests for food, um, Bushmeat and, and fish provide an enormous contribution to nutrition. Uh, if I'd known we were bringing samples, actually, I would have bought some nice smoked uh, antelope uh, to, <laughs> to share. Um, but, but fundamentally, forests have been managed for generations, for millennia, uh, for food. If you think of Sweden agriculture, slash and burn um, agriculture, people have been manipulating forests and managing forests for food in diverse smallholder cropping systems for absolute millennia. And this is a very important aspect of something I'd like to bring out into this, this talk. We have a very strong understanding of, of the, the relationship between forests and food. And obviously there's, there's a, a connection with sedentary agriculture as well as shifting agriculture. But forest food, um, forest foods uh, play a very important provisioning uh, role in most livelihoods of many, many people around the world. Um, I mentioned bushmeat and fish. Bushmeat, we understand its contributions to nutrition, and particularly in the absence of domesticated um, animals. And if you take the Congo Basin, uh, there's a, a, a large outcry at the amount of bushmeat being hunted and, and consumed. But in order to replace that nutrition provided by um, the bushmeat species concerned, you'd need to clear vast areas of forest in order to introduce domestic crops. So there are major trade-offs in terms of understanding the relationship between forest, agriculture, and nutrition. Fish is an interesting one. The forest bas basins of the world provide vast quantities of fish. But how do these, re these, these resources relate to each other? We understand a lot about the, 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 the plant-based re uh, plant resources of the, the rainforest. We understand a lot about bush meat. We understand a lot about fish, but not how they interact. What are the seasonality patterns? What are the understandings between um, the processes of, of off-farm, on-farm employment, how that in, in influences um, when a farmer particularly chooses to, to go fishing instead of uh, harvesting uh, sweet potato or whatever. So some very complex interactions going on in many of our tropical rainforests, and many of which are, have a strong regional basis based on the ecological functions and processes of the forest concerned. So it's all very well to have an understanding of the forest and fish issue, but we wanted to generate some evidence. So we looked at ways of doing so, and we have a, there is a fabulous data set, and those of you from USAID, please smile and wave because you're responsible for that. Um, <laughs> USAID have a, fa and I'm not creeping here, um, to USAID have a fabulous data set called the Demographic Health Survey. Um, uh, data which shows uh, levels of di di dietary diversity and nutrition. And we took those, those data for 23 countries in Africa and overlaid that with r remote sensing data. So it's compared dietary diversity and tree cover. And almost universally across those 23 countries, we found a very positive correlation between dietary diversity and tree cover. So the closer you are, um, to trees and forests and tree formations, and I include agroforestry systems in this, people had better diets. Now this is pretty powerful stuff, 23 countries without exception. We then upscaled our data analysis to another data set that we have called the Poverty and Environment Network, 32 countries, 8,000 households. It's hard work, I know you're smiling because you're obviously a data person. 
um, and found another very interesting correlation between uh, the extent of tree cover and proximity to tree cover contributed up to two-thirds of overall dietary intake. Again, a very powerful and compelling set of stats. In Indonesia, where we're based, uh, Indonesia is a fascinating country. It's 5,000 uh, kilometers in length, 17,000 um, islands in the archipelago, very, very different agri uh, agrarian uh, systems, and found exactly the same relationship. The prox proximity to forest shows better diets. Um, some of the, there are some variabilities within the Indonesian uh, example. Uh, oil palm plantations are, are a particularly interesting one. The, the massive transition from natural forest to oil palm, you'd expect because of the increased income uh, of local people that they would be uh, um, able to purchase more nutritious dietary uh, food. Uh, actually, it's the opposite. People are actually using their uh, it's disposable income to buy um, much more uh, fast food, if you like, in, in Indonesia. Uh, instant noodles, much more um, sugar-based foods, and they're moving away from the traditional um, uh, diets that they would have been uh, eating if they were still practicing farmers, particularly rice farmers. So we're seeing this gradual nutrition transition in many circumstances and in many places, but showing a general pattern that forests and trees do still play a major role in, in food security and nutrition. So that's the sort of co direct contribution of forests in terms of uh, fruits, uh, uh, vet leafy vegetables and other, and other products. But there's another, another aspect to this. The forests provide a very important role in sustaining agriculture. The ecosystem services provided by food, um, by forests rather, um, play an enormous role. And I'll give you some very good examples. In Indonesia, obviously, you're aware of the, the forest oil palm transition. Um, and the history of oil palm in, in Indonesia is interesting. Uh, it was introduced in, well, in 1880 to, to Bogor is it, in the town that I live. Um, but it wasn't until the 1950s, 60s, 70s that the commercial oil palm plantations were attempted. And yields were incredibly low uh, for many reasons, primarily because of pollination. So hand pollination was the, became the norm. The yields of the plantations were incredibly low. And in the 1970s, 1980s, <coughs> you excuse my voice, I, I just came in from Indonesia on one of those uh, nasty little planes that everybody's got some kind of disease. Um, <laughs> so, um, the, the, the Malaysians decided there must be some kind of pollinator. How can we, we speed up the pollination system of these, these, these plantations? So they sent a delegation to Cameroon and found that there's a little thrip a very small beetle that lives in forests in the night and comes out and pollinates. Is that it? <laughs> Ten minutes? <laughs> Seems a little unfair. <laughs> um, and these little thrips live in the forest that come out during the day and pollinate, do their pollination thing, um, and then go back into the forest. And what we're finding is as, as the palm oil estates in Indonesia um, grow and grow, um, their distance from forest patches are becoming increasingly distant and yields are dropping off accordingly. So we're doing quite a lot of work with the, the oil palm private sector who are complaining about the ecological issues related to the drop off of yields and we suspect this because of the, the pollination system. And so we've got a, a, a research project at the moment looking at how and why and wherefore the best landscape configuration might be to maintain forest patches for the optimum yields of the pollination, but also maintaining ecological corridors, etc. So there, there are other issues to uh, play here with regard to the interaction between agriculture and forestry. And then one more uh, really nice example is we're doing some work with the Wheat Centre, who traditionally have been concerned with um, more wheat and s on smaller areas of land. And um, in Ethiopia, what they're finding is yields are also dropping off uh, the further um, the, uh, the fields are from, from natural forest. And this is down, seems to be down to um, a climate regulation, the, the climate regulation provided by forests in proximity of, of the edges, if you like, of the, the, um, the, the wheat fields, um, provides a very nice ecological buffer. And the further you get into the center of the wheat field, temperatures increase, the diurnal temperatures uh, have such broad ranges that it's affecting yield. So there are all kinds of permutations where the forests and trees 
playing a very important role in sustaining agriculture. And I think this is a, a very interesting future research uh, topic. And I think one of the things that we want to continue to look at is, you know, we've heard about um, the importance of landscapes, the importance of integration of forestry and agriculture. Um, there have been four or five global landscapes forums, uh, which C4 and, and others have, have been uh, leading. Um, but on the ground, the reality is, is somewhat different. So there's a, the question that's always asked is, so what? We have this evidence. You've got forestry, you've got agriculture, and almost never the twain shall meet. But we have um, declarations on forestry, which talk of nothing else but agriculture. We have a declaration on agriculture, which talk, talk about nothing but uh, zero deforestation. So there's obviously some synergies there that we need to exploit, and we need to start breaking down silos. One of those silos that we've started to break down is getting foresters to understand that managing forests for food security and nutrition is a very, is a very important role that they can play. We recently published uh, a, a review, a two, three year review from the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, um, which shows, tells foresters, these are the recommendations and guidelines if you're serious about maintaining um, food security and nutrition in your forest management plans. At the moment, I chair a process uh, funded by the uh, Committee on World Food Security looking at sustainable forestry for food security and nutrition, primarily for the nutrition community. So understanding how forests can play a very important role in achieving nutrition and, uh, and food, um, dietary diversity outcomes. So we're sort of breaking down these silos and slowly these, these, these communities who never really talk to each other are coming together. And this is very important because what we're talking about here is systems approaches. And someone mentioned this earlier, that the, the whole systems approach, getting out of the silos, thinking beyond your particular discipline, beyond forestry, beyond uh, agriculture, towards a more landscape approach um, aspect. And, and certainly cognizant of 40 to 80 percent of the world's, of the world's food, or at least the, the food in the tropics, are actually grown in smallholder systems which are far more resilient, far more sustainable, uh, and need a, a lot more support than they're currently getting um, because of the transition into this big agriculture, big forestry. Um, and I think we need to use that to translate policy, the evidence that we've been, we've been generating, into some kind of implementation. Uh, I know that um, I've been watching the, the TV here a little bit, and. Uh, sort of house price thing, the house price things are obsessions everywhere you go. I was in Vancouver two weeks ago and it's the same thing. And you know, the monarch is always location, location, location. My message with food security nutrition in terms of linking forestry and agriculture is resilience, resilience, resilience. And I think that's the way to go. I think we need to think much more deeply about breaking down the silos of forestry and agriculture in a much more meaningful way than we've managed to do so far. And by <laughs> generating these, the types of evidence I've been uh, able to do uh, and present here, and, and there's a whole plethora of literature I'd love to share with you. It's all wonderful, n not too dense at all. But um, there, are, there are some ver very good um, references worth, worth looking at uh, and, and getting an understanding of the types of evidence that will already support that breaking down of the silos and bringing that resilience to the fore in global development discourse. Thanks very much.